Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. Chakshu, what would you say stands out to you the most about the old parliament building? I think a whole lot of things. For example, it's a building that we inherited from the British and how we made it our own. The fact that the constitution was framed there, everybody talks about that. That's Chakshu Roy, a parliamentary expert and the head of outreach at the PRS Legislative Research. But also the fact that the building is where our representatives debated a whole bunch of things. You know, after the 61 war, parliament was in session. When the liberation of Bangladesh happened, the announcement of that was made in the parliament house. And in the early 2000s, terrorists attacked the Indian parliament. A number of CRPF jawans lost their lives. Parliament was in session at that time. And the next day, parliament continued working. On the 28th of May, Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated the new parliament building, which had been in the works for over two years. Sathyo, ye sirf ek bhavan nahi hai. Ye 140 crore Bharat vasiyo ki akangshao aur sapano ka pratibimb hai. Ye naya bhavan आत्मनिर्भर भारत के सूर्योदय का साक्षी बनेगा ये नया भवन डिजाइन बाय द आर्किटेक्ट बिमल पटेल दिस न्यू ट्रायंगुलर शेप्ड बिल्डिंग हैज थ्री स्टोरीज इज स्प्रेड अक्रॉस 64500 स्क्वायर मीटर्स एंड इज पार्ट ऑफ द लार्जेस्ट सेंट्रल विस्टा प्रोजेक्ट दैट इज बीइंग रीवैम्प्ड अंडर द करंट गवर्नमेंट नाउ वी विल टॉक मोर अबाउट दिस न्यू स्ट्रक्चर बट बिफोर वी डू दैट वी टेक अ लुक एट द ओल्ड वन which actually lies just a few meters away from it in this special episode of the three things podcast we are speaking to chakshu roy about the origins of the indian parliament how it came to be and what it can tell us about the workings of our legislature and he says that although its foundation stone was laid in 1921 its history goes back even further law making is quite old in this country and the first set of laws were made by the east india company after the east india company the british government kind of took over the affairs of india and one of the earliest laws that got passed was the indian penal code and i think it was made in 1860 and it wasn't made in this new parliament building it was made in the governor house in calcutta on the first floor of the governor house there's a small room called the council room sometimes they do movie screenings there but uh, that was the council room where the law which decides as to what kind of crime and punishment works in this country was decided So that's where it all began a small room on the first floor of the governor's house in Calcutta with british council men sitting together to make laws for this territory called india but he says that things changed by around 1918 when it was decided that india should have a bicameral legislature meaning that there should be two houses in the legislature and not just one the idea being that you know some bit of the westminster model that was going to be there gets incorporated in india itself and a small room which could earlier accommodate 50 people would no longer be enough but the british government in india didn't actually want a separate council house when delhi was being constructed as the new capital there were no plans for a separate building the idea was that there will be a viceroy's house and in one section of the viceroy's house there's going to be a massive room and that's where the council is going to meet and uh, in latin's uh, biography his uh, great granddaughter writes that harding who was the viceroy at that point of time basically opposed any idea of having a separate council house he said my council meets in my house but in the house of commons there were mps who said that you know what we should be setting a better example for india and that better example would mean that any kind of legislature should not you know meet under the roof of the executive and this happened during the montago kemsford reforms of 1918 when the council got expanded and now there were to be two houses and which meant that you needed a bigger place and it's interesting one proposition came as like you know till the time we have a new building can we put it under a shamiana you mean like a tent like a tent and then better sense prevail and somebody said that you know that might not be the greatest beginning for legislatures in india so a foundation stone was laid in 1921 and the rest is as they say is history 
But coming up with the actual building was not as easy. It was Edwin Luttian and Herbert Baker who were the architects for the new capital city of Delhi. And they famously had very different approaches. Nothing that happened in the new capital city of Delhi was without drama. So we had these two architects, Herbert Baker and Edwin Luttians, who had completely different personalities. And uh, there were a number of clashes between them. Sometimes it was over money. Sometimes it was over just the idea of how the two of them thought differently about art and architecture. But by the time the new council house had to be decided... Latians and Baker had fought over the gradient of the road that leads to Rashtrapati Bhavan. And uh, the relationship was at an all-time low. Now, the plot of land on which the council house was going to be built was a triangular shape. And uh, Baker, being the slightly more pragmatic person, proposed a design which was supposed to be a triangular building. Latians was completely opposed to the idea, partly obviously because the two weren't seeing eye to eye and also because for aesthetic reasons, he thought that the triangle was too simplistic a building and he proposed a circular design. And uh, there was a lot of back and forth on that particular question. And finally, Latians prevailed and he got his circular design. So he, at one point of time, gloats in a letter that I have the building where I want it and in the shape I want it. And what's interesting is that while the building ended up being round, we are now back to the triangle shape with the new parliament. Yeah, because the plot in front of the old parliament house is again another triangle. So technically it's one big diamond and uh, the old parliament house is in a circle on one side and the new parliament house is in a triangle on the other side. It's just the most efficient use of land that you could think of. Yeah, it's almost like Baker got what he wanted in the end. Yeah, in the end. <laughs> but back then, Baker had to resign to Latian's vision and had to design a building that he did not like, and on a land that was thrust upon him. Anyways, he went ahead, put his heart and soul into the building, and designed a structure which would accommodate a lot of the constitutional principles. It was a structure that had a lot of harmony in it. All the chambers were, you know, around a central hall that kind of signified the centrality of the institution. Chakshu says that there were a number of things that Baker kept in mind while designing the building. For example, the legislative chamber was shaped like a horseshoe because he envisioned India to have a multi-party system unlike the UK. He designed the chair of the speaker and, you know, gave it a little bit of an elevation. The ceilings of the chambers were very high. So ensuring acoustics was going to be a problem. So he got in touch with a couple of academics at Harvard and a gentleman who was designing this acoustic tiles for a lot of big buildings. And uh, he had those tiles imported from the US to India and had them put up. In fact, a Nobel Prize winning physicist and an engineer of Spanish origin were also hired so that the building could have good acoustics. So by the time the building was done, he was kind of fed up to a certain extent with the building. But the building got done and the building was inaugurated in, uh, I think, January of 1927. And the next day, the Central Assembly started sitting in that building. Now, India's independence was still almost two decades away. Back then, the capital would shift to Shimla in the summer, where another council house was built. So technically, the current Himachal Pradesh Legislative Assembly was the other parliament where the Central Assembly would meet in the summers. And till about, for all of these years, council meetings from 1927 to 30 used to happen in two different places. By 1930, the decision was taken that it is way too expensive to move lock, stock and barrel to Shimla. So let's just kind of get rid of that move and stick to Delhi. And that's when the council house in Delhi, which would later be called the Parliament House, started getting used a lot more. But Roy says that things really picked up after 1947. Two or three things had to be done. We were a newly independent nation, so newly created institutions needed office space. So the Supreme Court, India didn't have a separate building. So it was working out of the Parliament House in that princess's chamber. It was converted into a courtroom and that's where the Supreme Court functioned till about 57, 58. The Union Public Service Commission didn't have its own building. So it worked in Parliament House for a couple of years. So it was this hub of activity. So there's the constitution getting formed there. There is a courtroom there. There's offices which have got nothing to do with the legislature are also within that building. So that was the first start. Later, a realization came that this building would not be enough. 
For example, the Constituent Assembly of India that was to frame the Indian Constitution was supposed to sit there. But there was no space for them because the current area for the Lok Sabha only had space for 140. And which was also a problem because after the first general elections, it was supposed to accommodate 450 MPs. So one of the walls had to be broken down, pushed back. The gallery had to be supported by marbles. There was some fixed seating and there were some temporary benches that were put across so that Lok Sabha could accommodate all of those members. Similar things happened in Rajya Sabha because Rajya Sabha also had a larger size. And amongst all of this, the parliament house was literally bare because when it was made, money for the capital city of Delhi had almost run out. So it was not as if that, you know, the building had a lot of decorations and paintings. So the decision came to Mavlankar, who was our first speaker, to decide as to how to decorate the building. And how did they do that? How did they go about representing the idea of this new nation in the parliament? In true parliamentary sense, everything gets done by a committee. So what Mavlankar did was put a committee of people and he tasked that committee to decide as to what should happen. Incidentally, Mavlankar had already travelled to a number of uh, European countries and studied their parliaments. And one of the things that he noticed in many of those parliament buildings was that the buildings had some kind of murals or paintings which depicted important events from that country's history. So the committee came to a decision that about 60 murals or 58 murals to be painted on the internal walls of parliament, which shows the history of India right from its birth till independence. So if you go onto the ground floor of the parliament building, the old parliament building now, and you'll see these beautiful murals painted all across the walls, which show this history and this evolution of India. Over the years, a number of technological changes were put in place. From automatic voting machines, which saved a lot of time, to modern cooling systems, which was required because now the capital was no longer shifting to Shimla in the summer. Then telephones came in and you had to equip the entire building with telephones for the secretariat, also for members of parliament to use. So with each progressive change in technology, the need for new office space because parliament was working more, meant that there was a strain that was cast on the building in terms of Things that were added to the building, which weren't technically envisaged, would be there. Chakshu, for those who may not have been to the parliament, is there anything in particular that would come as a surprise to them? I think lots of things that would surprise if you visit the building. So, for example, if you go to the central hall, the dome of the central hall is really wide and it's really high. So the fans are inverted. So these are these iconic inverted fans in the central hall. And you would never think of an inverted fan. You think of a ceiling fan, but you don't think of a fan which kind of rises from the ground and has blades that go around. So that's quite interesting. I think uh, the entire Parliament House is dotted with statues. So I think outside of a museum, Parliament House in Delhi is probably the most densely statued complex anywhere in the country. So I think there are close to 50 statues of uh, former parliamentarians, political leaders, people who contributed to our independence. So I think that's quite interesting. So I think there is a lot to see within the Parliament House and a lot to reflect about when you walk there. So for every listener, I would urge you to, you know, reach out to your member of Parliament and probably get a pass. And Parliament offers wonderful show rounds and they walk you through the parliamentary stuff painstakingly walks you through the entire building, explaining the different things. You get to see the gallery from where Bhagat Singh threw the bomb back in the day. So yes, fascinating building with a lot of history attached to it. And do you think the structure of a building like the parliament matters? Do you think that makes a lot of difference? To a certain extent, uh, it does not. Parliament can be anywhere where you would want your public representatives to be. But I think the significance comes from the fact as to that that there is a lot of emotion attached with the building. There's this quote by Winston Churchill, and maybe I'm not saying it wrong, but it goes something like this, that we make the buildings and the buildings make us. Now, if you associate the fact that the constitution was made in a certain place, then that, you know, space gets a certain bit of emotional value attached to it. When you realize that during the debate on a Hindu court bill, a member while participating in the debate died on the floor of the house, then there is a you know, certain emotive value attached to it. 
when you talk about the fact that a lot of your public representatives made personal sacrifices to come there. So I was reading a senior member of parliament's uh, biography and uh, it was mentioned in the biography that uh, he was discouraged from running for parliament because the pay is not good enough. And how will you support a family, a wife and two kids? You've just come from partition from Pakistan. So I think uh, that is what, you know, adds to the institution. It's not just the brick and the stone that of the institutions, the people that have, you know, gone through that corridor over the last 70, 75 years. That's what makes it an institution. Roy has been following and writing about the Indian parliament for over 20 years now. And for him, there are some moments that really stand out during that period. So, for example, members of parliament have to sacrifice a lot. So whenever members of parliament stand for their principles ahead of their political careers, that means a lot. So, for example, Speaker Somnath Chatterjee was directed by his party to vote in a particular way, should there be a tie during a confidence motion. And uh, he declined to abide by his party's direction, which I thought was an extremely conscientious decision putting forward parliamentary principles instead of uh, his party's directions to him. So that kind of, you know, stand out for me. In fact, Chatterjee was expelled from the CPIM for refusing to vote against the government during the no-confidence motion of 2008. According to Chatterjee, the expulsion was one of the saddest days of his life. The other incident that kind of stands out is when the supremacy of uh, parliament as a lawmaking institution, especially of individual members, comes about. So, for example, there was a private member bill on transgender that was uh, piloted by a Rajya Sabha member of parliament, Tiruchi Siva. And I was in the gallery watching the proceedings when that bill got passed. Now, the last time a private member bill had gotten passed was in the late 60s. And this was 2015. So that entire gap and for you to be able to see an occasion like that, I think that stands out. And what do you remember from that moment? What I do remember is that there were many people in the gallery who started clapping. And uh, the marshals who are there had given everybody very strict instructions that uh, the gallery is supposed to be just for watching. You can't be expressing support or disapproval about what's happening in the house. Many of us didn't realize that clapping is not the best way to do this. So the marshals had to come rushing in and basically tell everybody, you can't clap. But I think uh, there were a number of individuals who were supportive of that particular piece of legislation. So when they went out, there were a lot of pictures taken. I remember members of parliament taking a lot of pictures. So I, I think there are some of these things that stand out. One incident that I would mention that I read about was uh, in the first Lok Sabha when the election to the speaker was happening. Mavlankar was standing up as the government's candidate and then there was an opposing candidate. Mavlankar obviously won handsomely, but the opposing candidate in his congratulatory speech to Mavlankar said something very beautiful and he said that in true parliamentary tradition, I voted for you. And he said that it was not about the fact that I oppose you, but about the fact that there should be a contest. So I think there are some of these things that, you know, make you really believe that the institution of parliament stands for something. And how rare would you say a moment like that is? I wouldn't say it's very rare, but when it happens, it's beautiful to see that something like this can happen in an institution where politics is extremely competitive and people are trying to push forward the way they are thinking about certain ideas. Now, over the years, the parliament building saw a lot of wear and tear. Roy says that this is partly because of Delhi's extreme weather and partly because of the changes that were made to the building over the years. So when television came to Parliament and house proceedings had to be telecast, which means long, thick television camera wires to be connected. Wi-Fi came in, you know, similar problem. Before that, you know, networked cables to connect everything. And the upkeep of Parliament was not what was required of a heritage building. So for the longest time, uh, people were getting stuck in lifts or the staircases were very narrow. So things were piled in staircases and it became a fire hazard. Or when you ran out of office space, and this is something that I've heard from old parliamentary staff, that uh, back in the day when uh, people ran out of office space and they didn't want to move to another parliamentary building and they wanted their office to be in the main circular building, overnight and a toilet would get closed down and be converted into an office. But there were other problems as well. In June of 2009, for instance, a part of the ceiling on the ground floor collapsed because of LPG cylinders being stored on the floor above. 
There were also minor incidents of fire and blocked sewer lines. All this to say that the maintenance of this historic building was far from ideal. And also, to not to be too harsh to CPW, it's also a building which is always in use. So parliament is either in session or parliamentary offices are there. And if you really want to keep the building up to date and make sure everything's functioning, you either need to close down the building for two years or three years at a time and find another alternative venue to hold its sessions there and, its, and keep its offices there. Or you have to keep doing these makeshift things. And uh, now we have reached a stage that not only has the maintenance gone down, but the usability of the building in terms of what you would want to do with it has also come to a place where you really have to seriously think about either completely redoing it or having a separate institution. And we've gone down the path of having a brand new separate building where forthcoming sessions of parliament will come from. And this brings us to the new parliament building, the idea for which started in 2019. The initial reasoning being that the existing parliament building wasn't big enough and that the ad hoc extensions were putting a lot of stress on the building. But also when we spoke to Indian Express's Damni Nath, who has been reporting on the parliament, she told us that according to some, PM Modi actually had the idea for it back when he was the chief minister of Gujarat. I don't know what was uh, you know going on in the prime minister's uh, mind at that time, but people who are involved in the project and who knew him back then, officers of the government who were with the Gujarat government at that time are with the central government now. They say that it's something that he had talked about back then as well, that the country's parliament and offices of the union ministries should be modernized, should be reflecting a new India, as he says. And this idea of a new India has often been contrasted with what the Latians Delhi and the colonial era represented. This is perhaps the reason why, in the inaugural speech of the parliament, PM Modi underlined that India was shedding the mentality of slavery. Now, although the members of the ruling party had been there for the inauguration on the 28th of May, as many as 21 opposition parties led by the Congress had boycotted the event, saying that the government had insulted the president by not inviting her. There were members of the media who were invited, of course, and Damini had been one of them. And she described to us what the building looked like. So the building is made with sandstone. It uh, reflects the, some of the features of the old building, which it stands opposite from. Inside, uh, it is a modern building. At the entrance, there are reception desks like you would see at a hotel, which one would assume is where MPs would come in, visitors would come in and be greeted there and you know guided to their destination within the building. It is a massive building. It's 64,500 square meters. The corridors along the outside of the building, if you were to walk around it, would be 3.5 kilometers. About 80,000 square meters of sandstone cladding has been put on the walls outside. So the first thing that you notice when you go is the size and the scale of the building. Compared to the old one, the usable space, she says, is about double in size. So the Lok Sabha chamber itself, just the sheer scale of it was surprising. You couldn't see, at least I couldn't see very clearly across from one gallery to the other side of the hall. The speech of the Prime Minister and the Speaker and the other people from the podium could not be heard without headphones in the gallery. This is something which I have been told by Lok Sabha officials is something that they're working on, figuring out the volumes and other systems before the session is to take place there. This appears to be in sharp contrast to the old building where, as you would recall, a Nobel Prize-winning physicist was hired to improve the acoustics. But when it comes to the Lok Sabha, there is a reason that it is now considerably bigger than the previous one. So in his speech, the Prime Minister said that, he didn't say if, he said when the Lok Sabha is expanded, referring to delimitation that could take place after 2026, he said we would need a, a larger parliament to seat all these new MPs. और हमें ये भी देखना होगा कि आने वाले समय में सीटों की संख्या बढ़ेगी, सांसदों की संख्या बढ़ेगी, 
वो लोग कहां बैठते और इसलिए ये समय की मांग थी कि संसद की नई इमारत का निर्माण किया जाए सो नाउ द लोकसभा चेंबर हैज 888 सीट्स एंड व्हेन द सेशन टेक्स प्लेस देयर नाउ अ लार्ज पार्ट ऑफ इट विल बी एम्प्टी बिकॉज वी डोंट हैव 888 एमपीज बट सिंस द प्राइम मिनिस्टर हैज ऑलरेडी इंडिकेटेड दैट देयर वुड बी एन एक्सपेंशन ऑफ द नंबर ऑफ सीट्स दिस वुड प्रोबेबली कम इनटू यूज इन फ्यू इयर्स नाउ डी लिमिटेशन हैज बीन अ कंट्रोवर्शियल एक्सरसाइज and has raised concerns especially among the southern states damini explains why so delimitation has been frozen uh, as per a constitutional amendment till the first census taken after 2026 the concern particularly among southern states is that if delimitation were to happen based on the population alone states which have not controlled their population growth in the north would get a larger number of seats whereas states which have carried out family planning programs uh, successfully would lose in terms of uh, the number of mps that they get so by this rationale uttar pradesh would get a lot more seats than say kerala but besides the size of the lok sabha damini says that while walking in the halls what also stood out were the artworks that were displayed there so there is a variety of uh, artwork the entire uh, artwork has been curated and commissioned by the culture ministry the indira gandhi national center for the arts is leading that effort of the government but we don't know too many details about the artists where they come from and the design and the style that they've adopted only because the government is yet to release it and even on the day of the inauguration there were people from IGNCA who were guiding people through the artwork but then they said they weren't allowed to mention the artist's name and it's likely that all these details will be released later and one of the things that we came to know uh, later was that there is a map of akhand bharat which uh, was tweeted by the parliamentary affairs minister pralad joshi but again the government hasn't come out and explained what this is who the artist is and what they're trying to say with this but of course that tweet got a lot of reaction now the map of the akhand bharat along with india includes the regions of pakistan bangladesh afghanistan myanmar sri lanka and tibet and the rss the ideological parent of the bjp calls this region a rashtra based on hindu cultural similarities in the past the rss leader ram madhav has said that the organization believes that quote one day these parts which have for historical reasons separated only 60 years ago will again through popular goodwill come together and akhand bharat will be created unquote now it is worth noting that even though we have physically moved away from a colonial building that was designed by two british men under the british raj roy says that the way our parliament functions however is still very colonial to give an example the government decides when parliament will meet to keep a check on its itself there's no set calendar now technically you would want parliament to be keeping a check on the government when it wants to not when the government decides so that's a colonial mindset we meet you know roughly 57 to 60 days a year now that worked well you know when the britishers were there because they didn't want their government's uh, accountability to be so frequent and so detailed but now things are different you know we are a nation which is independent you know responsible for our own destiny and we have bigger problems so for us to be sitting our parliament to be sitting 60 days a year possibly not and will it be the best utilization of a brand new infrastructure that we built no so we should be thinking of sitting about 120 130 days a year now that we have technologically advanced a brand new building that can allow for that kind of rigor of use so next 50 years when you're having this conversation with somebody else perhaps the conversation would be more about as to what are the kind of debates that happen in that house where is it that members of parliament kept their political differences aside and agreed on a particular course of action because it benefited the country i think those questions will become equally important than just the shape of the building who was there who was not there you were listening to three things by the indian express today's show was written and produced by me shashank bhargav and was edited and mixed by suresh pawar if you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts 
You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcast and write to us at podcast at IndianExpress dot com.